Hey, everybody. My name is Rich Cortez. I'm uh, one of the pastors here at Cornerstone. I want to wish you a happy new year. It's so good to have you uh, worshiping with us today. If you have a Bible this morning, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 9 through 13, which is the Lord's Prayer. And so you want to grab a Bible and, and get that handy. And while you're doing that, I have a confession to make. I find that prayer can be very challenging. Like many of you, I know how important it is. I know I should be praying. I know I should do it more. And yet when I sit down to pray, I get distracted. Things happen. I can't help but think of Pastor Dave's message from last week. There are lots of distractions. There are barriers that are things that keep uh, my prayers from being effective and having uh, the impact that God would want them to have. And the one that stood out to me last week that Pastor Dave message, mentioned in his message was uh, the one to husbands. I don't know if you remember, he said, husbands, uh, from taken from First Peter, he said, husbands, dwell with your wives with understanding so that your prayers be not hindered. And that one really spoke to me. And whatever that verse means... However we understand that verse, it's clear that uh, there is a way that if I'm not uh, relating to my wife in a way that is appropriate, if I'm not living with her in an understanding way, that can hinder the effectiveness and the impact of my praying. And so that got me thinking. Uh, while he was talking about barriers to prayer, I began to think about prayer and was thinking about that this week and knew that I'd be speaking uh, today. And so I began to think, you know, why do we pray? What are some of the motivations and the reasons why we go to God in prayer? And so I want to take a look at that today. There are five things that I see here in the Lord's Prayer, five motivations, if you will, for praying, five reasons I think Jesus gives right here in the Lord's Prayer why we should make prayer a priority for 2021, really a priority for our lives at all times. So what we want to do today is we're going to read our text we're going to pray, and then we're going to jump right into it. Also, before I pray and before we look at our text, I just want to remind you that we're going to be having communion at the end. So you may want to uh, get that ready even now. Just get uh, some bread, uh, wine, or juice if you have something. And so at the end, we're going to celebrate a time of communion together uh, as we wrap up uh, the message. So Matthew chapter 6, uh, turn with me there, and, and uh, we're going to begin reading in verse 9. This is what Jesus says. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. We truly do. Lord, we believe it's a, a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, an infallible guide. And so today, Lord, as we listen to your word, we pray that it will speak to our hearts and change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, let's take a look. First of all, why should we pray? Number one, the first thing that I see in these verses here is that we want to pray because we want God's protection. We want God uh, to... Uh, empower us and help us to live lives that are holy. Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Listen, the first thing he says here, and I'm going to start at the end of the prayer and work my way toward the beginning. And so the first thing I see here is that Jesus says we should pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And that has something to do with protection. That has something to do with God watching over our lives and keeping us from temptation. It has to do with helping us to be victorious and to overcome and even push back uh, the sin in our own lives, the sin that exists in our families and in our communities, right? This is a, a prayer where we are praying against the powers of darkness and saying, 
Lord, lead us not into temptation. Keep us. Lord, help us to be victorious over, you know, my own weaknesses and my own sins and my own temptations. And so one of the reasons why we should pray and one of the motivations to pray is so that we will grow in holiness, that will grow and become more like Christ, will grow in character and godliness and all of those things. And so that's the first reason I see uh, here today. And I'm going to run through these pretty quick. Uh, we'll slow down as I get toward uh, the top. But uh, so that's the first one. We're praying for God's protection, God to watch over us. Secondly, we're, we're encouraged to pray for healthy relationships. We're encouraged to pray that, that our relationships would be marked by forgiveness and grace. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, when you pray, pray this way. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In other words, Jesus is saying we should pray, God, forgive us of our own sins. Forgive us of the things that we do wrong as we forgive those who sin against us. And so here we're praying that, that our relationships would be marked by grace. They would be marked by mercy. They would be marked by forgiveness. And you can hear even in this part of the prayer that there's a social, a relational dynamic to forgiveness. Right? Jesus says, forgive us as we forgive others. And so I think when we pray this part of the prayer, we're praying about relationships that are, again, marked by grace. They're marked by mercy. That our relationships would, would evidence that kind of thing. That people would see that in our homes, our families, even in our church. This past week, I uh, saw an article. I, it was just a couple of days ago. The title caught my attention. And it was about a young man. Uh, this was a guy who was uh, a mixed race. And he was upset, and I think rightfully so, he was upset at his classmates in the way that they were using the N-word. And so this guy's anger was justified, and he was really, really irritated at the way that some of his classmates, most of them white, were using that. They weren't using it in the typical fashion. It was showing up in songs and in other ways. And so there was a young lady in his school uh, she was 15 years old, and uh, when she got her learner's permit, um, she was excited, and she had recorded something on Instagram or Facebook, and, and in that little video, uh, she used the N-word, and he was upset, and this young man said, I'm going to grab that video, and I'm going to hold on to that video, and one day I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it to teach that young lady a lesson, and so he held on to it for a couple of years, and as she graduated from high school. She had applied to a university, and at that university, they had a cheer squad where she had tried out and got accepted to, and uh, just when she got word that that's where she's going, and this is the school she's going to be at, uh, this young man released that video, and uh, the school turned her down, said, sorry, uh, we can't have someone uh, like this uh, on our team and in our school. And while that young man was rightfully angry and frustrated, right, Christians are to be people who are characterized by forgiveness and grace. That's the kind of relationships we ought to have. And, and, and we, we learn how, because of what Christ has done, to forgive even our enemies, even those who are against us and use us and say harmful things against us. We're to love and to be forgiving. And so I think Jesus is urging us here and, and really motivating us to be praying for those kinds of relationships, that our lives would be characterized by, again, this grace and this mercy. A third thing I see here, a third reason, a third motivation, if you will, for praying uh, is because we want to see God's provision in our lives. Again, Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. Give us this day our daily bread. And so here we are praying for God's provision, that God would provide for us all that we need. I think that this part of the prayer is an allusion to the Exodus, where Israel was being led out of Egypt. They were there uh, for 400 years, uh, enslaved, and, and God delivers them. And in those years of wandering in the wilderness... God provided for them. Manna, if you may remember. Each day, families would go out and gather what they needed. And so large families might gather a lot, but they would not have a whole bunch left over. 
Other families were smaller and they would gather just a little, but they would always have enough. And so I think this prayer is a reference to that. It's a reminder of that. And Jesus is telling us we should be praying to God for, for our needs, that he would provide for us what we need. Lord, give me what I need for today. What I need to provide for my family. Lord, I have bills that need to be paid, right? We should be praying for that. This is a motivation to do that. One of the reasons why we pray is because we want to see, again, God's provision in our lives to see him provide for us. So again, uh, you know, maybe your car needs some work. Uh, your, your exhaust system is leaking and you have to get that replaced and it's going to cost you $1,400 and the brakes are going and that's going to cost you more money. Uh, I know that from experience. And so here we're praying, God, provide for me. Provide what I need. I need my car and Lord, I have to pay rent and electricity and all those kinds of things. And so Lord, help me. But not only are we praying here for God's provision, we are also praying here that we would be content with what God provides, that we would be grateful for the way that he provides, that we would, would be uh, uh, happy and, and trusting in God's provision and even generous as God provides for us, we understand that he's the source of every good and perfect gift, that that would free our hearts to be generous in giving. And so really, in all three of these petitions that I mentioned here, we're not only praying for them specifically, but we are praying that, that we would become people, again, who, who are trusting and content and grateful and even generous, that we would be people of grace who know how to give and even receive forgiveness, that we would be people who are growing in, in, in godliness, in character, in holiness, and overcoming temptation, that we would become all of those things. And here's what I learned about growing and changing and transformation. I've learned that uh, transformation and change really is the culmination of both human effort and endeavor uh, and sometimes intense human effort at changing and, and wanting to become, again, a more generous, a more grateful, or a more patient person. And it is also a gift of God's grace, the result of his spirit in us, the fruit of his spirit residing in us. It's both of those things. And I learned that from passages like Proverbs chapter 2, where uh, Solomon talks about growing in wisdom. And I think what is true for wisdom is true for other areas in our lives as well. And Solomon in Proverbs chapter 2 says this. He says, my son... If you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. In other words, Solomon is saying, listen, if you're willing to put in the effort at growing in wisdom, you'll become a wise person. If you're willing to listen to advice, if you're willing to listen to criticism, if you're willing to cry out for understanding and lift up your voice for insight. And that means, uh, are you willing to ask people for help? Are you willing to go to someone and say, listen, I need your help. I don't understand this. How do I do this? Uh, I'm struggling with this area and I need some help, right? If we're willing to go and to get advice from pastors and mentors and family members and friends, if we're willing to put in the effort, even intense effort, Solomon says here, if you search for wisdom as for hidden treasure, if you look for it as if you're looking for silver, you'll find it. And, and silver and treasure, man, you, you turn over a lot of dirt for a little bit. It comes in small pieces and dribs and drabs. And so again, Solomon is saying, if you're willing to put in the effort, then you'll grow in wisdom. If you're willing to put in that intense effort, you'll grow. Like an athlete. You know, athletes have to, to 
you know, do drills, and drill after drill after drill. They have to practice hour after hour. They have to put in the time to be great at what they do. Or if you're a musician, you have to be willing to practice those songs over and over and over again, learning scales and learning the song and playing it and working through. If you're willing to put in that kind of effort, or if you're you're a student, you're willing to study, or if you're working at a company and you're willing to put in the hard work and time to make that business or your, your position in that company successful, then you'll succeed. But that's not all that Solomon says. Notice what he says here. In verse 6, he says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Solomon says that growing in wisdom is both the result and the culmination of of effort and work as well as a gift of God's grace. And that's where prayer comes in, right? When we begin to recognize that this is something that God gives, right? It should motivate us to pray. And Jesus is encouraging us here in the Lord's Prayer to do just that, to pray. Say, Lord, I, I know that, that provision is part my responsibility and part your gift of grace, that you're the one that provides. That forgiveness and grace and, and the ability to, to have a healthy relationship requires me to be patient and gracious. And Lord, it's also a gift of your grace. And so I think we're encouraged here to, to put in, if we're going to grow, if we're going to change, if we're going to be different this year in 2021, then prayer has to be a part of it. We have to make every effort. We have to be willing to put in the time to become a patient person or a, a gracious person or a generous person. But we got, we must, we must pray as well. There's a fourth motivation here that's listed in the Lord's Prayer that I want to bring to your attention. And that fourth one is we all want to see God's intervention in our lives, don't we? We want to see him. We want to experience his presence and his power. We want him to lead us and to guide us. Jesus again says, when you pray, pray like this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And here again, we want to grow in our awareness that God is present that he's, he's leading, that he's guiding, that he's healing, that he's doing things. We want to have an awareness of his presence and power in our lives, certainly when we gather together as a church, but in our families, in our homes. We want God to, we want to see his hand. We want to see his guidance, and we need it, right? We want God to, to, to guide us in our decision-making. Lord, should I take that job? that would require me to uproot my family and move to another part of the country. Lord, is that something I should do? Lord, your will be done. Show me, is this what I should do? Lord, should I take that promotion? Uh, the money would be good, but Lord, should I take it because it would require maybe more time away from my family because I'll have to travel more? Lord, if I did take that promotion and had extra money, what should I do with that income? Should I give it away? Should I save it? What should I do with it? We need God's guidance. Lord, should I, you know, take this job? Should I purchase this home? Should I go to this school or that one? Should I marry this person? There are hundreds of decisions that we make in the course of our lives for which we need God's direction and guidance. And so we pray because we want that. We want his intervention in our lives. We want him to show us what we should do. And not only that, when we pray, your kingdom come, we're praying for God's lordship in our lives, right? We, we say to ourselves, Lord, I, I want to come under your lordship. I want you to, to show me how to live my life. I want to come again under your lordship and your guidance. I want to come under your word. Teach me and show me. And so here we're praying even more for God's presence and power in our lives. And maybe you got a diagnosis from a, a doctor that said, you know, hey, this doesn't look good. 
And so we're praying, Lord, your kingdom come. Lord, we know that you can heal, that you have power. Come and touch my life and heal me. Lord, your will be done. We pray, uh, Lord, perhaps for family members who don't know you, and, and we say, Lord, your kingdom come. Open their eyes so that they might see who you are, that they might come to know you. They can't know you. They can't see you unless, Lord, you are opening their eyes and helping them to see who you are. And so we pray because we want all these other things. We want God's protection. We want healthy relationships. We want his provision. But we certainly want his intervention in our lives as well. We want to be more aware of his presence and his power. There's one more that I want to mention and uh, this one, I've, I kind of work backwards from the end to the beginning because I think this one is really the most important reason for prayer, the most important motivation when it comes to praying. Notice that Jesus starts out this prayer by saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Here, I think what Jesus is saying is that the ultimate goal of prayer is worship. The ultimate aim of our praying, the ultimate result of our praying is to see God and to see how awesome and powerful and amazing and glorious he really is. It's first here because I think it's most important. We are praying here. The word hallowed means to make holy. And so, so what we're praying, and this is a prayer, this is a request like the others in this prayer. We are saying, God, we want you to make your name holy, to reveal who you are. And holiness is not just a revelation of his character. It is that, but it's more than that. It's seeing God's character and being amazed by it. It's seeing his wisdom and being awed by that. It's coming to know his love and being humbled by that. And, and the response to that is to worship and to glorify him. And so we're praying, Lord, make your name holy. Yes, we want to see you for who you are, but we want to see both the beauty and the splendor and the awe and the wonder and the kind of wonder and awe that would would even cause me to tremble in your presence because I realize that I'm not worthy to be there. I've used this illustration a number of times, and so I, I apologize for using it again. Just used it in our men's group on Wednesday morning. We have two men's groups, one in the morning and one in the evening. And so, men, I encourage you, if you're looking for a place to connect, that's a great place uh, to do it. And just recently in the group, I was uh, talking about my trip to the Grand Canyon. No words can do it justice. If you haven't been there, you need to put it on your bucket list. It was amazing. And the more that I looked at it, the more that I was drawn into it. The closer I got to it, the closer I wanted to get. I really wanted to get as close to the edge as I possibly could. And the closer I got, the more wonderful and awe-inspiring it was. And again, words cannot do it justice. But the closer I got to the edge, the more careful I was, the slower I moved. That's kind of like what we're talking about here. We have to realize the danger and the delight of being in God's presence, that, that God is beautiful and wonderful, and, and he draws us in with all that he is and all who he is, and as well, we have to realize that he's holy and that there is a sense in which we're out of place in his presence. And if it weren't for his grace and his love and his provision, we wouldn't be there. And so that's what we're praying here. We're praying for God to open our eyes that we might see him for who he is, his splendor and again, his glory and wonder. And this is what Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning of verse 17. He says this, he says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints, all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge 
that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul is praying there that our eyes would be open to see how deep, how wide, how magnificent Christ's love is. It's better than knowledge. And he's praying that we would, we would know this in a personal and even intimate way in our lives. I think that's what Jesus is getting at in the Lord's Prayer here. When he starts out by saying, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He reminds us it's, it's, it's a relationship with God that is, characterizes him as Father and that we would see again awe and wonder and splendor. You know, when I went to seminary, I don't know who it was who said it there, but I think that's the first place that I heard it. Someone said that all good theology ends in doxology. That means all good theology ends in praise. It ends in worship, right? The aim of our teaching and preaching and ministry is that people will worship God even more. The end of that is that they leave more in awe of who he is. They see more of him and know him better than before. And I think that's true of prayer. The end of praying, the goal of praying, the start and the finish of praying is that we might experience God's love, that we might know him, that we might be more in awe of who he is. That's the aim of it. You know, and that's what we see in the Apostle Paul's life in Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 33. Paul has, for 11 chapters, been talking about God's work of salvation in saving people and how God has brought that about in, in the amazing way that God has been at work in the world to bring about salvation. How he can be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus and in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, after 11 chapters of just talking about this, Paul breaks out in praise and he says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his paths beyond finding out and tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor, who has ever given to God that God should repay them for from him, and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Again, Paul just breaks out into praise before he begins talking about really how to apply the gospel to our lives. And that's what we're saying here. That when we pray, it may not happen every time, but, but some moments we should find ourselves in God's presence, just overwhelmed just amazed by who he is and his love for us. So I think there are a number of reasons why. I think this is the first and most important reason that we would begin to see God. We would begin to know him more and more. We want to see his intervention in our lives. We want his provision. We want to see our relationships characterized by grace and mercy and forgiveness and, and healthy and, and vibrant relationships, and we want God's protection. All of those are, are great motivations to be praying in 2021. So how do we get there? How do we do this? Well, I'm sure there's a lot we can say about that. I just want to mention two that are going to be immediately obvious to you when I say them. They're taken from the life of Jesus. From one verse at the beginning of Mark, in Mark chapter 1 and verse 35 Mark records this. He says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And the first thing I see here is that if prayer is going to be as we have been talking about and the powerful and amazing thing that it can be, uh, we must make it a priority. It has to be important. It has to be a priority for us. We have to carve out space in our lives to make room for prayer. Sometimes we have to get up very early in the morning while it's still dark before anyone else is awake to spend time with God. That's the way it is. Now, it doesn't always have to be in the morning. I'm not a morning person. I don't like getting, getting up really early 
in the morning, I wake up slowly. It takes me a while. I like to drink my coffee. I do like to read the Bible and pray in the morning. That's my favorite time to do it. And so I like to prioritize it then. But you know, I don't exercise in the morning. I think exercise is important. But I do that at night. I do that in the evening because, you know, I'm not ready to do it in the morning. But the thing is, I've had to prioritize it. And sometimes it's inconvenient. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's, you know, uh, interrupts dinner, but I make space for it and I get it done in the evening. And I think that's what we see here in Jesus's life. He, he knows, you know, all that was going on before this verse, healing people and all that would follow after it. You know, Jesus understood, I have to get up and carve out some space and some time right now before anybody's awake so that I can pray. We got to make it a priority. We have to carve out that space to pray. And then secondly, I think we need a place to do that. Notice Jesus went off to a solitary place to pray. I think we need a little solitude when it comes to prayer. I think we need to get off by ourselves and, and pray. And I know right now some of you are probably saying, you know, that place is in my car on the way to work. And I have a little solitude myself. I have a 20-minute drive here, 20-minute drive home. There are times when I pray in my car and I feel like God speaks to me and shows me and I get ideas and things while I'm in my car. But it has to be something more. We really need to find a place where we can just minimize the distractions, get quiet and get before God and listen to his voice and seek him in prayer. You know, my daughter was just home for Christmas. Uh, she lives out in Minneapolis, and she, she came home, and uh, she told us that she's been dating someone for two months. Uh, she, you know, all the conversations and phone calls we've had over the past couple of months, she never mentioned it. And so when we had gotten together, uh, she let it slip. It wasn't an accident. She let it out, and uh, her mother and I didn't really react. In fact, she was a little nervous how we might respond to the fact that she's dating someone who's a little bit older than her. And uh, uh, we just didn't respond at all. And the reason we didn't was because my son was there with his kids and other family members were there, and it just was busy. And we couldn't really sit down and have a real good conversation with her about this person that she's now dating. She was a little upset by that. But finally, when everybody was gone and it was quiet and we had opportunity, we can sit down and ask her a million questions, you know. Hey, who is this? Tell us about him and all those kinds of things. That's true with God. We need to, again, get in those places where we can really just remove the distractions and spend time with God. Listen, if prayer is going to be the kind of powerful thing that it should be, right? If we're going to even remove some of those barriers that Pastor Dave talked about last week, right? We, we have to make it a priority. We've got to find a place and then let these things motivate us to pray. I know you want to see change in your life. I know that you want to experience God's presence and power and provision. You want to see him transform relationships in your family or your church, your community, I know you want his protection. I know you want to grow and overcome. And so the only way that's going to happen is if we make prayer a priority. I want to give you an opportunity today to uh, respond to not just this message, but really to respond to God. And we're going to do that by uh, sharing communion together. We're going to do this in a moment together and respond to what God is doing. Maybe he's speaking to your heart. Maybe right now in this moment, you realize that, that you need to, to make prayer a priority. You need to carve out some space. You haven't been giving it the time and attention that it needs. Again, I'm there with you. I want to give myself more fully to prayer this year and draw closer to God. I want to learn how to be quiet and restful and patient in his presence. I want all those things. And so if that's you today, I want to pray for you as we share communion today. And maybe, maybe you've, you, you're watching today for the very first time and you recognize and you sense in your life and maybe that's why you're here because you're disconnected. You feel disconnected from God. And you're right. 
You know, sin separates us from God. And the only way to reconnect, the only way to reconcile with God is through Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. His life, his death, his resurrection was on your behalf. And that's what communion is really all about. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, take, this is my body which is given for you. He does the same with the cup. And he, he says, this cup is the cup of my blood. It's the cup of a new covenant, an everlasting covenant. It's shed for you. And as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim his death. And what it means for you means forgiveness. It means reconciliation with God. And it means the outworking of that in our lives and the, the reconciliation with others as well. And so if that's you today and you're ready to take that step of faith and surrender your life to Christ, I want to invite you to find uh, some bread and juice or even wine and, and, and celebrate with us as a, as a statement of faith of saying, Lord, I'm putting my trust in you. I need you in my life. I feel that disconnection and I want to be reconnected to you as I put my faith in Jesus. And so as you eat the bread and as you drink the cup, it's, it's, it's saying I'm putting my trust. It's not, not the element itself. It's not the cup, but it's the faith and the belief of what these emblems represent and how Jesus gave himself for you. And so if that's you today, you can participate with us as you surrender your life to Christ. And so I want to pray for you as well. And as we do that, as we prepare to, to receive these elements, would you pray with me? And if you're surrendering your life to Christ, I want you to pray with me. I'm praying out loud. You just pray along with me to surrender your life to Christ. Let's pray together. Father, today we come holding in our hands the emblems, the reminders of your broken body and your shed blood and what they mean for us. Lord, you are the one who justifies the person who has faith in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we come as we remember all that you have done for us. And we pray, Lord, that you would reignite our faith even today as we remember what you have done. That, Lord, it would renew us today as we seek you. Lord, help our prayer lives to to be transformed this year. Lord, may we make it more of a priority because of what you have done. Lord, you have given so much to us. And so help us as we surrender to you. And Lord, for those who are taking a step of faith today and saying, I'm surrendering my life to you. As today, as they, they hold these emblems, the, the bread that represents your broken body, the cup that represents your blood, Lord, may they, as they put their faith in you and trust in you, may they experience the new life that you intend for them today. Forgive them and wash over them with your forgiveness and grace. And may they experience new life in you today. And Lord, we pray, even as we eat and drink and remember all that you have done, your healing power and grace touch our lives. Lord, those who are sick in body, would you stretch out your hand to heal? In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let's eat the bread together. And let's drink the cup together. And, you know, there's another way that we respond to God and the ministry of his word. It's through giving. Again, traditionally, that has been the response of, of believers down through the ages. They would come to the end of a service like this one, and uh, they would receive an offering to help advance the gospel and care for the poor. And we, in that same spirit, in that same tradition, do the same here at Cornerstone. And we want to give you an opportunity today to give. There are a number of ways that you can give at Cornerstone. You can text your giving 
uh, through the uh, Push Pay app. You can go to Push Pay and uh, look for Cornerstone Church uh, Cheshire, Cornerstone Cheshire, and you can give that way. You can visit our website, cornerstonecheshire.com, and look for the giving tab. And there's a way for you to give right there, and uh, these options are listed there as well. Uh, you can give through our website. It will take you to push pay, and you can give uh, that way as well. You can uh, simply mail in your offering if you would uh, like to do it that way. That's one of the ways uh, that you can give and we appreciate your faithfulness in giving. In all these months uh, that we've been, at times, not even gathering together, uh, we have been blessed because of your faithfulness. And we appreciate uh, your commitment to spreading the gospel, not only here in this area, but around the world. And so thank you for your giving. Uh, I want to pray over the offering as we prepare to respond in that way. Uh, so would you join me once again in prayer? Father, thank you today for your blessing and your abundance and your provision. Lord, it's our joy to worship you today with our tithes and our offerings, our faith promises. Lord, would you use them to advance the kingdom of God here and around the world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we're praying and believing for a great new year. Just want to remind you that starting on January 11th, we have 21 days of prayer. Hey, that is a great way to kick off uh, your prayer life. If you want to re-engage and reprioritize that, we'll be meeting online and here in person at 7 a.m. We go for about one hour, and uh, we would love to have you participate in that, again, either online or uh, in person. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you'll have a blessed, blessed week. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday.